On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the December 6th, 2021 edition of What The Ship Is Going On. Five leading stories in maritime news. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCagliano, the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science here at Campbell University, former Merchant Mariner, and an adjunct instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. So five stories, a lot of them dealing with topics we've covered in the past, but some new ones going on, including this first one, involving a ship fire off the coast of Sweden. This is an image pulled off Twitter of the fire on board the Almirante Storni off the coast of Gothenburg, Sweden. Fire took place on the forward end of the vessel. The ship is carrying heavy timber. You'll see it's stacked above its main deck. You'll also notice tugboats in position to assist in the fighting of the fire. One back aft here providing fire suppress or actually providing fire protection wetting down the cargo to prevent the spread of the fire. Other tugs up forward here providing more direct attack on the fire. This image just came out on Twitter. Here you'll notice elements of the Swedish Coast Guard, beautiful vessels, on scene to help. You'll see that we're seeing white smoke, meaning that the vessel fire has seemed to have subsided. The report coming in on G Captain, which is right here, discusses the fact that the fire on the cargo ship carrying timber off Gothenburg on Sweden's west coast was still not under control on Sunday after more than 24 hours. The Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, MSB, said it sent two helicopters while several other authorities and organizations, including the Coast Guard, were also fighting the fire. The ship's cargo timber had caught fire on Saturday while the ship itself was not burning. The fire was difficult to extinguish. The crew of 17 have not been evacuated uh, it goes on to say, we can't say the fire is under control, but at least it has not spread. I pulled this video off YouTube on the event. Let's go ahead and let it play here. You'll see the fire burning on the forward part of the vessel. The ship has apparently maneuvered to keep that fire blowing forward. One of the things about keeping the crew on board is you maintain control of the vessel. We learned that with Zim Kingston. And by keeping the fire blowing toward the bow, you're able to prevent the fire from sweeping along the entire length of the vessel. That vessels tend to want to turn bow into the wind. And by maneuvering this vessel, they're keeping that fire kind of pushed toward the bow. You'll see other tugs in the area here helping to provide fire suppression. The vessel itself would be hard to put this fire out. The amount of hand lines used by the crew would not be enough really to extinguish a vessel of this size. If we go into marine traffic, here is Alamorente Storni right now off the coast of Gothenburg. If I zoom back out of here a second again, this is the very northern top, uh, tip of uh, Denmark. There's Norway. Here's Sweden right here. Uh, Gothenburg is a major port in and out of, of Sweden. Uh, the vessel itself, uh, I'll give you some particulars here. Uh, she's basically a bulk carrier, nine years old, flagged in Liberia, about 31,000 deadweight tons. If we again pull her up on the map, one of the things you'll see is the absolute number of vessels that are providing support here for her. Here she is. You'll see two large Swedish Coast Guard vessels. There you go, the Triton and KBV001. You'll see some tugs here providing the additional suppression. We saw the tugs firing before. Bob's on scene. And then several SAR and rescue vessels on scene. So they seem to have quite a bit of rescue assets on scene to assist this vessel. We saw a very similar process when Zinn Kingston caught fire off Victoria in British Columbia. Matter of fact, uh, Zim Kingston just went into port following all that fire and for download. So definitely an interesting story. We'll be following this one to see what happens with this vessel. So that's the end of story number one. Story number two takes us up to Vancouver, Canada. We've been following what's been going on with Vancouver. Again, horrific rainstorms had taken out road and rail connections between Vancouver and Kamloops. We've seen the reopening of some of the highways, partial railways, 
But on top of everything else, they had a trucker strike that just got averted. Uh, this story on Thursday, Vancouver port trucker strike averted as union reaches deal with second carrier. Uh, like they don't have enough problems. And we did a story just on Friday about a vessel that sailed from Shanghai all the way over to Montreal in the Great Lakes to offload cargo. And now Vancouver is suffering this on top of everything else. So now you got severed railways, severed highways, backups in the port of Vancouver. We keep talking about backups in the port of LA and Long Beach, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But Vancouver is suffering this entirely too. This story again from last week, Port of Vancouver struggles to recover container bunkering operations, talks about the backlog. And all you gotta do is look at marine traffic to see this. So if we zoom out here, here's the entrance into Vancouver. This is through the Straits of Juan de Fuca. If you come in here to the area of Vancouver, one of the things you'll notice are these vessels all lined up here. These are bulkers that are anchored right now, waiting to get into Vancouver. They're all lined up here. Just pull up one at random right here. The, the ruler, bulk carrier, you'll see she's doing the Vancouver, but without an ETA at this time. And this is not the entire, this is a holding anchorage. If you come up into Vancouver itself, you'll see the big anchorage right here is already full. So. These vessels are loading grain and ore out of Canada, which they cannot do. And the backup due to the rail line is causing a domino effect here. Now, they've got part of the rail line open as far as I know. One of the rail lines had reopened back up, but they had shut back down again. They've also got more weather coming in, which is going to be a, a massive problem. They are using the port up here, Port Rupert, this is the other port they have up here in uh, northern Canada and northern British Columbia. So Rupert is being used, uh, but it is at the also at the end of a very long rail line. You'll see vessels lining up to come in here, but the vast majority of them are waiting for the opening of Vancouver. And until Vancouver opens up, you're just going to see these vessels just continually anchor here and pile up off the port. And even if they open, even when they get everything open, back up to 100% operation. It's gonna take a while to get caught up. Again, when you shut down a port and you close things down, you create a butterfly effect. We've seen that with Long Beach and Los Angeles due to COVID. We're seeing it now on the port of Vancouver on Canada's West Coast. That's story number two. Story number three comes from Washington DC and the White House. So I mentioned this last week in What the Ship is Going On. But it made the news again, so I'm going to cover it again. So Eric Kulsich with Freightways posted this story uh, just today. White House Port Envoy details strategy for supply chain fluidity. Mix of incentives, presidential pressure, forcing industry to compromise on shipping fixes, Picari says. Goes on here. Uh, the response to the supply chain crisis at ports was disjointed until the White House got involved, says Port Envoy John Picari. In a lengthy interview on the Bloomberg podcast, Odd Lots, which I fe featured last week, the supply chain czar said the Biden administration is acting as an honest broker to get cooperation from industry and local jurisdictions acts, uh, that usually act in their own self-interest using carrots and sticks to make small improvements while building towards more systematic improvements. And this story goes on to discuss what John Picari said. I highlighted most of this in the story I did last week. But again, I want to highlight a couple of issues here. Number one, the ports are not operating 24-7. So the 24-7 thing keeps coming up. Uh, he also focused on how the administration pushed the ports and labor to adopt a 24 schedule for truck gates to take advantage of off-peak capacity, major cargo owners to operate warehouses at night so motor carriers can make deliveries. Again, they are not operating 24-7. Port of LA gate operations for this past week, December 5th, everything was closed except for Phoenix, which just initiated a incentive program. CMA, CGM took them over, which again, Picari took full uh, uh, recognition of that they're the only ones coming here that he's talking about it right here. Although CM, CGM did announce it will temporarily subsidize its own terminal to stay open later. And again, Eric notes this, there's only one terminal trying the concept so far. 
but again, it, it, it's it's a misconception. Again, it's a short period of time too. I mean, they're open pretty much 18 hours out of 24. But one of the things I, I have a big problem with is the fact that the federal government is taking credit for this. You also note the federal government is extending California a $5 billion credit facility through the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act and Ra Railroad Rehabilitation and Improvement Financing Programs. Wow. You, really could come up with a shorter name than that. And it gives the state, quote, a hunting license for the first time ever to actually build a program of projects, not just at the port, but inland from the ports. It might be rail capacity, grade crossing elimination, freeway capacity, maybe purchasing sites, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and modifying them for use as intermodal container transfer facilities. So, I mean, this story goes on and, and talks about what Bakari wants to talk about. But again, if you come back over to here, Eric wrote this the other day, this is December 3rd, fixing poor congestion takes politics and patience. Again, this details it a little bit more. It's talking about the politics of what's behind it. You know, they're, they're touting again, the metric put out by the White House and their supply chain blog that look, the nine day dwell is going down. We're, we're seeing improvement in that and they're trying new things, but again, the issue here is the federal government has very little oversight here. There is one hammer they can pull. The FMC is not going to do it. They, they, they do not have that ability. They've been basically emasculated through legislation and they're not ones to go out and, and do this. They are undergoing these studies. You know, they're, they're looking at studies and, and incentive ways to do this, but the one hammer that's not being leveraged yet is that the ports can be nationalized in times of a national emergency, not just war, but in times of national emergency. And that is through the Maritime Administration. But there is no Maritime Administration here. We haven't seen anything either from the acting Maritime Administrator uh, or the appointed Maritime Administrator, who still does not have a confirmation date yet for a hearing. It's not like there's a maritime issue going on here, people. And all of this, all of this is in the backdrop of this story by Alpha Liner, which record, records record profits for the container carriers. The 10 leading container carriers have made as much as $120 billion. $120 billion. To put that in the context, the entire container industry in the decade before this, 2021, made a grand total of about $38 billion across 10 years. And in 10 months, they have made $120 billion. Am I getting excited about this? Yes, I am. Because there is no incentive here for the container carriers to do anything. And let's be clear, we deregulated this industry and we benefited greatly from it. We got low transportation costs. We got fantastic rates for a decade. It was great, more than a decade. It was fantastic. But what do we get in the process? We ran U.S. firms out of business, U.S. lines, Sealand, APL. Yeah, the APL exists, but it's not really the APL that it, it did exist. Likes lines. Ran them all out of business. And now we're trying to get a control of nine corporations that are overseas controlling 85% of the world container industry. It, it, it's just not a lot. And when the port envoy start sitting there saying, listen, it's taking the federal government to come in to make these people talk. Well, you should have been making them talk long before this. Plus, we're a year into this. And oh, by the way, the Biden administration has been in power now since January, and we're in, we're in December. So again, this is 11 months. So I, I don't know if I'd be taking a lot of bows on this one yet. That's story number three. So story number four takes us back to beautiful Southern California, the sunny shores of Los Angeles and Long Beach. This story by Greg Miller on Sunday, it's official, 96 container ships are waiting to dock at Southern California ports. Okay, I have been on a tirade, I admit it, I admit it, I've been on a tirade about the disingenuous nature of the ports of LA and Long Beach and the Maritime Exchange of Southern California and the PMA and the PMSA in routing these vessels out to sea. I, I'm, let me be clear, I hate this. I, I don't like this idea. I understand about the environmental issue but you are putting vessels out at sea. And we're gonna talk about why that's an issue. But finally, finally, 
they have acknowledged this. So Greg Miller came out with this story building on a series of articles I'll talk about here, where he talks about the fact that when you look at the vessels and the number that are out there, when you add in the vessels loitering or slow steaming further offshore than 40 miles, we're at record levels. We are not getting a handle on this. You know, again, the, the port, the White House, all these people are saying there, oh yeah, we got, we're seeing reductions, we're seeing reductions. We're not, we're not at all seeing these reductions. When you start adding in the vessels that are steaming offshore, you're seeing that in the numbers. And again, we're finally getting traction in these stories. Here's a Bloomberg story. Bloomberg has been on this quite a bit. Uh, new counting methods suggest US ship long jam is longer than ever. Uh, Greg talked about this, that ships are now in a California log jam, now stuck off Mexico, Taiwan, and Japan. And then Lorianne LaRocca went even further, talked about this, blasting through the West, Court, uh, West Coast congestion bluster. She broke it all down, looking at the uh, uh, times it's taken to get there. And finally, finally, we see this in the Maritime Exchange data that's out. They do a tweet every day on numbers. But once a week or so, they put out this Facebook post, and this Facebook post is much more detailed. But what you see here is them adding these numbers in here, including the vessels that are in the, uh, uh, the SAQA, which is the, uh, uh, the air quality area. And this right here shows you the uh, uh, vessels, how they've grown with up to 56 vessels. These are the vessels that are in the holding area right here. You'll see them off. Southern California as far down as Baja in Mexico, as far north as up in San Francisco and vessels slow steaming across the Pacific, north of Hawaii here and coming across on the Great Circle route over. Now, I should mention that there are issues with these routings that they're taking these vessels. This story came out, Mike Schuller over at GCAP and put this out, Costco ship loses container during Pacific crossing. Uh, Costco container ship and route to Long Beach, uh, California reportedly lost dozens of containers overboard in the Pacific Ocean last month. The 4,500 TEU MV Costco Nagoya has returned to Korea. AIS shows its last known position in Guanyang, which is just south of uh, uh, Busan, or Busan, excuse me. You'll see the vessel got out just north of uh, Hokkaido, northeast of Hokkaido, off the Kurils, when she suffered a loss of containers. Again, we saw this last year with ONE Apis, almost a year ago, matter of fact, a year ago and last week, I think it was, ONE Apis lost it. We have these huge low areas in the Pacific right now with high winds that vessels have to be routed around. Now, fortunately, with slow steaming, vessels can route around this, but the danger here is if these low areas move into the area off Southern California, then those vessels are going to have to evade, head out there, which means that they're sailing more, which means they're dumping more emissions into the atmosphere. And again, if the issue here is to reduce total emissions, we're not doing that. If the issue here is to keep smog out of Southern California, well, then it's working. But again, I go back to this issue that the Maritime Exchange, the PMA and the PMSA have no authority whatsoever to tell these vessels to head out into this area and just cut holes in the ocean. They can't order them out more than 12 nautical miles off US waters. And even then, I, I have serious doubt about it. Only the Coast Guard can keep them outside of US territorial waters. And the fact that these vessels are out here, I think you're gonna to expect to see the Northern Pacific, which is this is, this is the Northern Pacific, is going to start getting rough. And we're going to start seeing more vessel losses and vessels sailing slower. That parametric rocking is going to have a bigger effect on these vessels probably than sailing at speed through oceans. We'll see what happens. But again, at least they're acknowledging now the vessels in the account. That's story number four. So story number five is one of my pet subjects. It's not a pet subject. It's the one I did my doctoral dissertation on. So my doctoral dissertation was on the role of the Merch Marine in national defense, United States from Spanish American war to Iraq war. And my past has been really talking about the role of the Merch Marine in, in national defense, specifically through sea lift, the transportation of troops, cargo, fuel, you name it for the U S military in time of war. 
a lot of my articles, if you go back and do a Google search on me, especially on GCAP, and you'll find articles that I've done really critiquing the US government, because I think our military sea lift is at a critical junction here. We are woefully, woefully neglecting it. And we've neglected our own merchant marine and we've neglected our military sea lift. This story that came out on November 30th, Navy says congressional cuts would put MARAD, that's the Maritime Administration sea lift plans, even further behind schedule. The reason I'm raising this issue today is we're hearing a lot of issues regarding Russia and Ukraine and what should happen should Russia invade Ukraine. If the United States was to react, how would we go about doing that? And earlier this year, we had a test act activation of our reserve fleet. In 2019, we did this and it was abysmal. We had 61 ships, we tested about 33 of them, 34 of them, and we achieved a 40% test rate. It was horrific. This past September, we did this again. We had a better test where we only tested 18 vessels out of 54, and the activations was better, but we're still woefully short of the number of ships we need to be able to transport the necessary forces from the United States to anywhere in the world. We use several fleets of vessels to do that. So one of the fleets we use is the Military Sealift Command. These are vessels that are owned by the Navy, but operated by merchant mariners. Not known by most people, but one out of five ships in the US Navy has a civilian crew. And there are 13 cargo ships that are earmarked for this in reserve in the United States. Plus, we have two squadrons, actually three squadrons of vessels in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean in the Western Pacific, loaded with two brigades of Marine Corps equipment and one brigade of Army equipment. This is a fleet of vessels that are maintained by the Department of Transportation. Uh, they are former merchant vessels that are pre-positioned in sites along the United States coast, Gulf Coast, East Coast, West Coast, and can be activated in five days. Problem is this is a really aging fleet. The average age of these vessels is over 40 years old. And real question about the viability of them. And then we have what's called the Maritime Security Program, which are 60 active vessels in the US Merchant Marine that are paid to maintain themselves in international trade. Basically they're given a subsidy to offset higher operation costs for being US manned. The problem is right now, obviously ports are jammed shortages of containers, and these vessels are all booming with trade. It's really hard to pull them off regularly scheduled service. They can't, don't get me wrong, they can't, but it'll be a huge disruption in trade more so than what we're seeing. And again, I, I think that this story is a really interesting one because the military really needs to understand, and not just the military, but the US in general, needs to understand that military power and sea power is a mix of Navy and commercial shipping. The Chinese have re realized this. The Chinese Navy is the second largest Navy in the world. The Chinese Merchant Marine, along with Hong Kong, is the second largest in the world. The US Navy is first, but although numbers have been surpassed by China, but the US Merchant Marine is 21st. And that's story number five. So there you have it, top five stories for December 6, 2021 in the maritime sector. Again, we'll be following along there. There's reports coming out further about the vessel off the coast of Sweden fire. It seems like they're getting a better handle on it, getting it under control. Again, we'll be following the issues with the port of LA, Long Beach and Vancouver. All of that is obviously crucial. Major West Coast ports that are being swamped right now. Uh, the issue with LA and Long Beach is, is always developing. So it'd be interesting to watch. And the military sea lift operation is gonna be an interesting one. Uh, hopefully, obviously nothing comes of that, but still an issue that really needs to be addressed is the state of our military sea lift for the U.S. and our commercial merchant marine, which is something I'm working on. Got the series coming out on the nine container liners, started filming that, putting it together. So we'll be putting those little five minute videos out. Hopefully you enjoy those. And uh, that's it for Sal. So until our next episode, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Share it across social media. Be sure to leave a comment. And as always, if you can, if you can, please support our channel via our Patreon page. We really appreciate it. Uh, it allows me to free up time to do these reports. So until our next episode, Sal, sign off.